Hi, thank you so much. Uh, so hello everybody, my name is Jonathan Hawes, and this presentation covers what I didn't learn in school. Uh, so for some context, I went to university in Florida, uh, and while I did not study cybersecurity, it was heavily ingrained in the creation of our cybersecurity program. We ended up becoming a nationally sort of renowned university for cybersecurity, winning national collegiate cyber defense competition, the national collegiate, collegiate pen testing competition, a number of years in a row. So we're quite familiar with how at the collegiate level things should be performed, especially when it comes to cybersecurity education. However, on that grain, you know, we had this realization as we were progressing through that maybe this wasn't done in the best way. Perhaps we could go a bit further, perhaps we could learn a bit more in terms of how you can actually make a really good cybersecurity education. And these are my sort of findings in that area, what I've learned, what my thoughts are in terms of, hey, you know, here's the real potential for growth, how can we actually go through with that? So, uh, for some context, I work for a cybersecurity company called QuantSAM right now that deals with the blockchain. Uh, while I won't be talking about that, a couple of people may have questions about that that I can potentially answer and how I'm now using the core I have had into traditional application security and incident response and now going into this. So, yeah, uh, you know, blockchain isn't all time shares. Uh, I practice a lot of realistic, like heavily ingrained application security. Uh, the stuff I'm doing right now is formal verification and static analysis. So it's nice to be able to merge these worlds. Uh, similarly to how I was able to merge the collegiate and the professional world, I'm seeing the ability to do that now with blockchain and cybersecurity as a whole. So merging these fields, it's finding what interests me and taking and putting it together is my real my real shtick. It's really what I'm passionate about. So I like many things. And I think this is important to say because when you have people like me where I, I've been in cybersecurity for quite some time, someone doesn't have their microphone muted. I'll figure that out, T Haven. That's a bit peculiar. Um, while I am a person who's gone through a lot of aspects in life in terms of um, you know, cybersecurity and specifically having that focus, um, I'm still a person. And I think that's important to point out because it's something I've routinely found when I'm approaching new grads. It's often the question of, hey, you know, what are you planning to do? How are you planning to do this? You know, you're interested in cyber. What, is, what does that even mean? What does that even include? You know, I was presenting on things like this when I was in school, you know, threat modeling with Tor, which was not something that was, you know, consistently thought of. The premise of that being a open, like, security discussion topic, like, even a couple of years ago, just wasn't something that was accepted as a new grad. But now we've been able to shift that. We've been really able to expand that space, and that's huge. So, as I said, you know, I'm still a person. I still have fun, and this is my music. Uh, this doesn't represent my employer. This doesn't represent Sam. Uh, this is representing me directly. Uh, and, and as part of that, just sort of talking about my findings in the space and how I can best benefit those around me. So as we see, we have 127 attendees right now. Ideally, I can inspire 127 of you on, you know, maybe you haven't considered how you can give back to a cybersecurity education. Maybe you did. If so, here's somewhere we can actually look, focus, and maybe have a productive discussion about it. So that being said, I also do the, the hoodie on the suit thing. Uh, a lot of this is business focused. A lot of this is focused on uh, more the critical end of how one increases their viability as a security engineer from a perspective of, you know, incident response, application security, these various focuses. I'm, I'm going to cover them in some level of depth, but I'm not going to inherently say, hey, download these tools, do this thing. Uh, I'm going to say more abstract, because I think a lot of security, and at least in my experience, Security education should be abstract. So, um, yeah, I've worked at a couple of places. Uh, this was a Wikipedia-like article uh, that one of the uh, blockchain companies wrote about me. So I've worked at a number of places. I worked at Lockheed, uh, Apple, Amazon, and Snap, uh, NerdWallet, and a couple other places. So I've run security at a number of companies, or at least in some capacity, uh, at various companies usually operating as a pen tester or a software security engineer like a snap um, or an application security engineer. So I've sort of seen the gamut when it comes to cybersecurity. I don't particularly have one area that I've said, this is my sole niche. So as I said, I'm the head of information security for QuantStamp. We're working to bring security to the blockchain, bringing smart contracts, and we're you know hiring. So if you're interested, Jonathan at quantstamp.com. So 
why am I giving this talk? I've had a fairly unusual career. Uh, I went from InfoSec intern to security manager in about four years. Uh, so going from nothing to SISO is, is fairly quick. Um, and that being said, you know, I like to give back puns. I like to give back interesting things. I've had a number of findings that I think are important to share with other people. So, uh, see? Uh, as I said, I went to university, uh, but not for this. I went to the University of Central Florida. I eventually graduated, and despite managing an active team of cybersecurity engineers, uh, I got a B in topics in cybersecurity. Uh, that professor I now have is now running for senator, and I sponsored his company on working on cybersecurity initiatives. So what I want to say is it's not always representative. You know, what you get education-wise at a collegiate level is not always going to be representative of what, of what the real industry is like. When I was in school, we were covering aspects like visionaire ciphers and just relatively low impact content. This wasn't something where I could go in and say, yeah, you can totally walk out of this with a skill set that's required for a security engineer. Individuals were walking out with a skill set that would be required for a security engineer 20, 30 years ago. So as I said, most of my professors are great. Some of them still teach. One of them is running the Senate. So I'm not going to openly say, hey, you know, this university is doing a bad job. Because frankly, this university is doing an amazing job. And most of them are trying their best. But I do have a bunch of critical feedback. And this is what we'll cover on that. So where did I succeed? Like, where did I find the way that despite this kind of shifty cybersecurity education, how did I still get into the spot I am now? And the way I best did that and the way I've openly encouraged individuals to do that is by going through outside activities. So I had the core bonus of working at a school and studying at a school where our primary focus was individual growth from a competition standpoint. So I was a member of Hack UCF, which is a collegiate organization based with a number of individuals who really enjoy cybersecurity topics. And Knight, uh, Sec, which is our CTF team, a CCDC, which is the Collegiate Cyber Defense, so that's defending, and CPTC, which is completed for penetration testing, so the attacking aspect. I spent a vast majority of my school time devoted to these endeavors. In fact, we had the running joke that the semester you're going to join CCDC is the semester your GPA goes down, because it's quite a bit of work. We're talking about spending what is frankly a full-time job, while everyone on the team is expected to maintain a full-time job, in addition to a full source load. So we're working something like you know, 40 hours a week on cybersecurity, regardless of you, whether or not you have an actual job in cybersecurity. But this is how the majority of my friends and now colleagues got into the field. A number of us were very vested and hey, like we're really learning something. We're really actually doing something. And then that translated into, wow, most of us have jobs now in this field doing exactly what we expected to do. So Amazon, uh, Apple, Google, Facebook, all these companies ended up recruiting from uh, CCDC just because they realized but there's a dearth of knowledge there. There's a vast untapped potential, and everybody who's realizing that is now going in and saying, okay, well, maybe we can capitalize on that. You know, maybe we can go and find what, you know, what's bubbling here. And it's, it's real-world experience. Real-world experience, effectively, is the nature of whether or not individuals get to succeed here. And the way I look at it from that perspective is that's what most of these programs are providing. It's where we can easily expand. It's where things like SANS come in. You know, you can do as many course loads as you want in school, but unless you're going into that specific area, you're really missing out. And I think that was what I ended up really talking to SANS about and getting interested in, is because SANS is offering just that. Without that practical application, without really seeing the stuff that actually matters, the stuff actually used in the field, you're tremendously missing out. In fact, we'd encourage people who are going to go on to do a graduate certificate to go look and, hey, maybe there's a security course that you can actually take. It's going to be about the same cost, but you're actually going to learn something. So here's some background on me. Uh, I started off very Fortune 500. Uh, I worked at HE Supply, which is effectively the Amazon for hammers. Um, since then, I've been a number of security engineers at a number of places. Uh, I led the red team at Snap. I was a corporate security engineer at Snap. I, you know, I was an engineering manager for a bit at Apple. I was an engineer at Amazon. I've been vSizo and Sizo for a number of organizations. So I've sort of gone through the whole gamut, which is usually expected to be 
for maybe a 10 year career and I've done it in about four. And that's not just because I got lucky or because I'm really smart. That's because I had really, really good things sort of fall into place and then managed to capture them at the right time. And as I said, I'm gonna talk about those in just a second. So lesson one, I will say, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm doing. And that's important. A lot of people find that to be a bad thing, but frankly, it's been my benefit. A lot of people presume that you have to go through this one thing. You know, uh, the Twitter statement right now is, you, well, you have to work in, you know, uh, help desk, or otherwise you can't be good at InfoSec, or you have to do this, otherwise you can't be good at InfoSec. And frankly, I think that's wrong. Um, people who are good at InfoSec are simply those who are good at InfoSec. Every job I've had, I've said, well, this is the peak of my career. You know, I'm not going anywhere further. I'm not going to improve anymore. And, and that's a lie. By not following that simplistic viewpoint, by not following that viewpoint of this is the best I'm going to get, I found my largest benefit. So to, put, to sort of hint on that, you're not where you work, you're not what you've worked on, you're not where you're working on now. Like It's important to recognize these aspects do, at some level, make you a bit of who you are, but they're not everything. And learning they're not everything and that, realistically speaking, I'm just kind of going with the flow here, has been hugely monumental. It's a really good practice to just take a step back and say, you know, okay, maybe I don't have to follow the other flow. Maybe I don't have to do this. You know, a lot of people would say, okay, you're going to go work at some Fortune 500 company. Maybe you're InfoSec 1, soon you'll be InfoSec 2. And while that's totally a valid technique, it's not necessarily what you have to do. Part of this is learning that, you know, the standardized workflow in this field isn't always standard. So... I likened it to this uh, when I talk about to people about InfoSec, sort of what my job is like. Um, you know, we, we so often see, you know, this is InfoSec, this is InfoSec. You know, if you're not doing this, you're not doing InfoSec. And, and that's not the way to really look at it. That's not the way to look at InfoSec in reality. InfoSec is at many points a fire, and it's learning how to put that fire out and responsibly understand it. So number two, uh, life comes at you really fast. A lot of people um, will say, again, this is the way to do InfoSec, and, and that's just simply not the case. So I ended up in this field because I complained to my ex-boss about chicken. Uh, you know, I didn't expect to... Yep, I'm totally aware of that, Sandra. Ab absolutely working on that. Unfortunately, the place I'm at ended up having some work done quite literally across the street, so this was the best I was able to get uh, in the short run why they're deciding to cut the street during the middle of my talk, I wish I knew. Um, so yeah, like I ended up in InfoSec literally just because of a coincidence. It wasn't something I immediately said, hmm, you know, this is what I want to do, but it ended up just really being convenient. So I was attending a B-Sides talk because it was at my university. I thought it was going to be interesting. I went and it was. So again, there's no real, you have to do this, you have to do that. And anybody tells you that, frankly, is missing the point. There's no right way to do InfoSec. There's no wrong way to do InfoSec. But there are some ways that will be best beneficial for you. This is my ex-boss. Uh, you know, I find it important to note that, again, he didn't follow the normal InfoSec path either. A number of people that I've done, they haven't necessarily done the, I'm going to go to school for computer science. I'm going to go to school for information security. Ian, my boss here, went to community college focusing on a completely different topic. But he ended up in InfoSec as well. And now he does risk management for dark. So a vast number of my course mates and classmates uh, did not cover cybersecurity. And a number of the classes that I had at school didn't cover cybersecurity, even the ones I actually taught. For most classes, the idea of covering modern security flaws was just not looked at. The idea of presenting on something like stage fright would be absolutely just unacceptable. It wouldn't be something that was covered. Instead, we would cover things like, you know, Visionaire or how a Caesar cipher is important. And while those certainly had their impact in modern day InfoSec, they're not modern by any stretch. I say old school security, and I say so jokingly, because frankly speaking, we're talking far more old school than one could imagine. So yeah, we covered the Caesar Cipher, Visionaire, Hill Cipher, Dez, and ROT26. I say so jokingly, because we didn't even cover ROT13, a really simplistic, very terrible way of sort of enciphering things we didn't even cover. You know, we definitely recognize that there was a lot missing here, especially with all the student organizations I helped set up. We said, how can we improve this? How can we make this better? What can we do? And one of those things was realizing 
we have to change the quality from within. We can't just settle on what we have right now. Because settling on what we have right now is simply unacceptable. So CCDC, on the other hand, the student organization that I joined through my school covered a lot. We covered Windows administration, incident response, network security, IDS and IPS, web applications, firewalls, Linux admin, log ingestion, threat discovery and hunting, aspects that are, you know, modern day cybersecurity. Let me see how charged this is real quick. Perfect. I'm going to move to a space that is potentially quite a bit quieter. Give me just one moment. So the modern day sort of coverings that we've had are, you know, very, very different from what I was being taught in school. What I was being taught in school didn't cover anything that would be deemed infosec -y. What I covered in school was deemed the bare minimum. It covered the minimal amount of cybersecurity. It would occasionally and very regularly on occasion touch upon these topics, but it would more be, hey, this is happening in the outside. You know, we just got some news about this. Maybe let's talk about it. But it didn't ever cover it to a level in which, you know, CCDC did. I actively did Windows administration. I actively did incident response. So for individuals looking to get into cybersecurity or individuals that already are who are looking to get other people in, especially at a collegiate level, one should definitely consider these programs. It's actively being able to apply your skill set and actively being able to benefit people in a way that they can actually do something. You know, it's not just studying, it's hands-on. And that's a large part of what this presentation is. The hands-on availability, the hands-on potential is so much greater. So CPTC covered web app pen testing, threat modeling, and while we didn't necessarily use a methodology like Stride, there were a number of methodologies we did cover. Penetration testing, soft skills, risk engineering, and time management. You know, we covered things that as a day-to-day -day seem normal for InfoSec, but if in the spectrum of class, you don't cover these things. Nobody ever tells you, you know, hey, you really need to consider the fact that this report is due and it needs to get to a client a week in advance because they need to review it. These are things that could easily be covered in school, but just simply aren't. So some do it really good. I've pointed out SANS and it's not just because I'm speaking here, I frankly think they do a really good job. Any place that offers a certificate, because this is often the question I get, why do you have no certificate? Well, unless the certificate comes with a level of real world experience, you're probably not getting the full value. One of the things I really like about SANS and a couple other organizations is they really try to say, hey, you know, do something with it. Don't just learn it, do something with it. See what you can actually apply from the topics you've been looking at. Don't just simply say, well, this seems to be, you know, a level. This seems to be something that's of value. Actually do something about it. So if that's learning about web application security, for instance, a good example would be maybe pen test the web app. Maybe go in and say, you know, I've got this code base. Now how do I secure it from the OAuth top 10? This is a number of relatively simplistic things one can do to actually bring real value to what they're learning. That being said, certificates are definitely a fantastic recruiting filter, and nobody taught me this in school. It's a really important aspect that you definitely should be touching on if you're not, and if you don't have a lot of experience in the field, certificates are fantastic. Certificates say, I have at least put the energy in to be excited about this. And if you're doing DOD things, so if you're trying to get a clearance or work in a clear job, chances are you very likely need some sort of certificate or degree in the field. So one of the things I wish school, frankly, had really taught me is that security really focuses on, hey, you know, I'm having someone else vouch for you, which is a normal infosec practice. People are going through and saying, yes, I vouch on behalf of this person. I know they know what they're doing. I know they know what they're talking about. And that's important. So that brings us to having an understanding of how the enterprise works. As I said, you know, taking on someone, learning something, is a lot like risk management. When you're doing risk management, you're saying, do I trust this vendor? Or do I trust the people that trust this vendor enough? Am I certain that they can do what I expect them to do? Do they have an understanding of my threat model? Do they have understanding of the risks I take in? And that's something we have to do at a collegiate level. You know, if you're bringing on an intern, there's a lot of inherent risk. They don't necessarily know these things. You have to go through and say, I'm going to teach you how to do some of this and the rest of which you have to learn on your own. And a good way of doing that is exposing them to things like CDC, CPTC, and programs like SAM. It's going through and saying, I'm going to, you know, 
not necessarily teach you, but I'm going to give you the resources. And this is something schools could do better. A lot of schools just inherently don't do this. They note it. They'll occasionally say, oh, yeah, you know, we're partnering with this institute. But then they don't always go through with it. I remember my school was saying, we're going to get the best cyber teachers. But the best cyber teachers, frankly, aren't going to work for a university at this point. They're already working at programs like SANS, where they can focus explicitly on the content that is important to them. Likewise, learning the enterprise is taught really well through these programs when you're working in stressful environments. One of the biggest things where CCDC and CPTC really succeeded was by having an environment in which you're reacting under stress. And this is hard to replicate in a school-like environment. A classroom will have some benefits for you, but until you're actively attempting to perform incident response when someone's trying to hack into your servers, or when you're actually having to perform incident response, period, you know, it doesn't mean much. It's one thing to learn about how to use volatility or FDK or some of these tools. It's another one to actually use them, actually go through the process. And this is something schools can easily do. Schools need more hands-on activities and more situations to replicate this. By mirroring things taught in CCDC and CPTC, this can be easily understood and easily replicated. That being said, one of the most important things never taught at any point during my school is that vendors existed. When you're going through school and you sometimes cover, you know, InfoSec in your classes, there's a lot of ideas that you have to learn how to do everything yourself. And that's simply not true. Anytime I'd have people come up to me saying, hey, how are you dealing with GDPR? I'd say, well, I have a touch on it. I understand it, but I'm also using a vendor because the vendor's going to focus on GDPR. They're going to know GDPR a lot more than I do. And this is something we need to teach to people who are entering the field. Vendors are this hidden secret. You know, it's not necessarily that you have to do everything yourself, and that's okay. You, know, you can do some of it. You don't have to do all of it. So I got into security because of chicken. Um, and the joke here, frankly speaking, is that networking is not just the cat fives. It's not just this and that. Networking is going out, going to conferences, talking to these people, and going on Twitter, having a blog, things that, realistically speaking, aren't you know something huge in, in other fields. The idea of, oh yeah, I'm on Twitter, that's definitely going to bolster my security presence, seems a bit ridiculous to people, but it's huge. Speaking of, of these events, I got into security because of just attending an event. I wasn't in security because I was studying it. It was something that happened across the line. Networking is absolutely key. And again, I'm not just talking about Cat5 cables, although that's frankly a very good thing that, again, isn't taught in school. Sometimes you'll have networking classes, and I know there's many certificates and degrees that will teach networking, but the idea that InfoSec people need networking has kind of been pushed aside. When people say, oh, you know, it's important to work at the help desk, it's important to work in IT before InfoSec, they don't inherently mean it's important to do so. They mean the processes, procedures, and understandings you learn in that spectrum are important. The idea of knowing how to communicate with a customer, which is so vital in information security, is a process you heavily learn by running a help desk. So there's meetups. When I originally gave this presentation at Besides Orlando, I mentioned CitrusSec. There's so many different available options. I'm in New York right now, and frankly, there's six or seven security meetups here every day. In San Francisco, which is where I usually live, there's even more. There's Slack, there's IRC, there's tons of places people want to actively talk about InfoSec. And if you're not getting involved with those, you're missing out. This is something you can definitely easily do. You just need to know where to apply yourself. So join professional networks. OWASP, ISSA, IC Squared, InfraGuard. There's a number of organizations that are dedicated to information security and risk management professionals. They will be able to bolster your presence as a security engineer, and joining them, one, is relatively cheap, relatively simple, and the benefit that you're going to have is amazing. Being able to speak with like-minded individuals is probably the strongest part of my information security career, above all. Being able to talk to people who can give me advice and soundly say, here's your benefit, here's what I can do for you, here's what you can do for me, is fantastic. And it's highly underrated because then people simply don't realize the value in that. So LinkedIn is a good way to do it, but I think a lot of people honestly take LinkedIn with a, too much of a grain of salt. I've seen many people, especially after I gave this talk initially, say, can you introduce me to people on LinkedIn? Or can you use LinkedIn to say, I'm skilled at something? And I would say, frankly, no, I'm not going to vouch for you on LinkedIn for this because you haven't proven it. 
So one of the things that I've said about individuals with LinkedIn is show more. You know, if you're interested in malware analysis, and malware analysis is what really drives you, then go from there. Talk on LinkedIn about what you're doing in malware analysis. LinkedIn says I'm a cybersecurity cyber influencer and that one of my top skills is email sarcasm. Well, I'm definitely good at both of those things. Unless it's being demonstrated, there's no real inherent value to telling people that. So here's an interesting bit, tidbit. Again, including things on your LinkedIn can be interesting, but it's not necessarily reflective of who you are. I put myself as a cyber influencer for a joke, and then the Wikipedia article picked it up and said, John's a cyber influencer now. So take LinkedIn with a grain of salt. If someone says they're especially skilled at cybersecurity, consider who's endorsing them for it. Look through. Now, just because something is necessarily LinkedIn friendly doesn't mean it's friendly with the rest of the world. Just because something is not necessarily popular on LinkedIn doesn't mean it's not a really good solution. Some of the best startups I've seen for cybersecurity have no LinkedIn presence or very poor LinkedIn presence. So sell yourself. You know, present yourself as a viable candidate, but don't oversell yourself. What you need to do is focus on being the best you you can be and recognize that. One of the best things about InfoSec is people will be really direct with you. People will tell you exactly what they think of you and exactly how things are. And that's okay. You know, if you're not good at something, tell someone. They'll help you get, learn to get better at it. If you want to focus more on InfoSec from a strategic perspective and less from a coding perspective, you can do that. You just need to let someone know. Networking is a super strategic tool here, and endorsements are valuable as they are, but take them with a grain of salt. Or when you're getting an endorsement, maybe have someone talk about what you did. Talk about how you learned it, because that's effectively what matters. You're selling yourself by networking and doing that, but sell yourself with some value. Show what's important about you. Show how you differentiate yourself from the rest of everybody else. So Twitter is shockingly a super good resource for information security engineers. And when I was entering the field, I did not believe this for the slightest. I was under the impression that Twitter was for Kim Kardashian and Kylie Jenner. And while they're doing awesome things, you know, I didn't really think it would be a core tenant of my job. Surprisingly enough, it definitely is. A lot of the deal flow I have and a lot of the individuals and places I've worked have been a result of Twitter connections. I ended up getting in touch with my ex-manager at Snap through Twitter. You know, I met some of the people I've been close friends with in InfoSec from Twitter. And that's huge. Now, it is a heavily used networking resource, so use it. I've included my Twitter here, and you're going to see that these numbers have pretty heavily changed. Right now, I'm following a lot less people, and I've got a lot more followers as a result of some pretty heavily networking and deciding what I really wanted to do with this tool. That's the way that one should look at it. Twitter is a tool. These things are tools. When we stop looking at these as sites that are simply there for you know, talking and start looking at it with this, as a tool mindset, the same way you'd approach other tools in InfoSec, it's very, very, very powerful. Twitter, LinkedIn, they're tools. They're means to an end. They can help get you what you want. And by focusing on that, there's huge inherent benefits for you, and you're driving more value to the site. So security is a small field, with that noted. And people will remember you. If you're one of the person who goes on Twitter and says, well, this doesn't seem very interesting, or I don't like this, or I don't like this vendor, that's probably not a good practice. So take it with a grain of salt. Be kind, be smart. Talk about what you're passionate about. Do you want to blog about reverse engineering some malware? Do it. Absolutely do it. Send out a tweet about it. That's all you have to do. It's not a super complex thing, and there's a lot of inherent value in it. So Twitter is unrivaled when it comes to reach, and this is something people should definitely consider if they haven't yet. Um, when I went on Twitter, the idea of talking to the CSO of Facebook was a concept that just seemed impossible. I frequently tweet Alex now because I like getting his opinion on things, and it's easy enough to do. People are very open on Twitter, especially in InfoSec, and if you're not already doing it, consider it. People in InfoSec genuinely really want to talk to someone about things they're passionate about, whether or not that's CFIR or application security or just generalized risk management. These are open options. Hi from Atlanta as well. Uh, Atlanta is definitely a very lovely location and has a fantastic InfoSec team. If you're not already checking out B-Sides Atlanta, you definitely should. There's a number of really good events up there. Skipping this forward. Do it live. And I've said this a couple times in abstract, but I now want to really harp on it. Absolutely do it live. Applied InfoSec is the most important InfoSec you're going to get. You can read every book, do everything, 
but until you're actually doing it, until you're actually practicing InfoSec, you're not going to be able to get the experience you want. And that doesn't mean you necessarily need to have a job or an internship or be doing it in school. InfoSec is one of the best fields, but you, you can practice it from any device. If you're interested in InfoSec, you can go take a book and read about it and then figure out a way to replicate that. If you want to read about risk management, figure it out and then talk to someone about it. Risk management, the idea and the concept of risk is something that inherently is introduced in a lot of people's hearts and minds. It's already there. InfoSec is not some abstract field where you need to go through years and years of experience to be able to have an opinion on it. InfoSec is a field where you can have an opinion pretty much right up the bat, and that's a huge benefit. So no matter what that thing is, no matter how you want to focus on InfoSec and how you want to practice it, start doing it. You know, don't say, oh, in two years I'll be an application security engineer. Start now. If it means going through a project on GitHub and, you know, pumping up some flaws on it, do it. GitHub is a fantastic place. Say you wanted to, you know, dig deep in, into kernel development and you want to look at the security implications of things. Download the Linux kernel. It's open source. It's there. If you want to start looking at kernel vulnerabilities, start there. Download the source. Read through it. See if anything doesn't make sense. You don't have to have a deep knowledge of how to do it. Just do it. This is, it's, again, it sounds a bit trite and naive because just doing it isn't necessarily always an option for people. But if it's free and it's online, take a look at it. So take advantage of opportunities that are presented to you. For instance, if you're taking this or you're going to have the option to take a class, don't say no. With presenting to B-Sides Orlando, I just said absolutely. I didn't really consider it at the time. I wasn't worried about how I was going to get there or how I was going to present on it. I just said, sure. That sounds like an opportunity. And seizing opportunities like though, like those is so critical. That is one of the best benefits of our field. There's always going to be a chance to present. People love to hear about what other people are passionate about. And talking about what I've seen different from academia was something I'm really, really keen on doing. So it was a great avenue. Again, things like just doing it live. Someone telling you, hey, just present on what you care about. It wasn't something that anyone taught me in school. It wasn't something that anybody nailed down and said, yes, John, you should totally do this. In fact, when I brought up these things in school saying, well, it seems like the industry is different, people would just say, well, you're not seeing the right industry. Now, when I went to my professors and I said, well, I want to do cybersecurity, the result was, that's a niche field. Nobody's really going to go into that. You should consider software engineering. Obviously, that ended up working out pretty well for me, and now I'm doing security as my daily job. So if you're in school right now, go to your professor. Say, you know, what's your knowledge of the industry? Do you know any industry connections that I can talk to and maybe get a better understanding of what they do? If you're out of the industry, one of the fantastic things you can do is go to individuals and say, how can I help you? Whether or not it's a middle school, a university, or a high school, chances are they have a budding cybersecurity program, and you can be a huge benefit for them. Upper management is something I definitely wasn't taught in school, and it's something I wish I was, though. This is one of the aspects which I find to be most important because there's simply no introduction to this in school. My job is a lot of email. Like, I pay $27 a month to be able to answer email on an email client because it's very fast. When I was entering school and when I was considering cybersecurity, the few people that told me about cybersecurity in school said, well, you need to know, you know, ROP. You need to know how to do binary exploitation. You need to know this. You need to know that. Now, down the line, I've realized this is simply not true, but at the time, I thought this was the ultimatum. If I don't know how to do this or I don't know how to do that, there's simply no way I'm going to get a job in InfoSec. And that's not reality, and that's okay. One of the best parts about InfoSec is nobody's really defined it. There's no one right way or wrong way to do it. It's not like medicine or law where you're going to go to an, your undergrad and then you're going to go to another professional school and then you're going to practice a board exam and then eventually someone says, yes, you can now practice law, you can practice medicine. InfoSec is something you can practice wherever, whenever, and that is one of the beauties of the field. So my job is sending a lot of email, but I still get to do a lot of InfoSec. InfoSec is something that is really whatever it means to you. Information security is such a broad topic because it can be. If you're interested in going to you know, an application security conference, that's InfoSec. If you're interested in risk, man risk, risk management, rather, it's still InfoSec. Now, InfoSec is not this inherently strict, strict thing. And that's such a crucial aspect of what people need to realize and something that's simply not taught in school. 
you don't need to necessarily know how to reverse a binary search tree in order to get into InfoSec, but there is benefit. There's no one right way, but there's no one wrong way either. That being said, a lot of the aspect of what we're taught about in university is not this answering email. It's not the grungier parts of the job, the parts of the job that are less fantastic. If you go on the TV, all you're going to see is, I'm a hacker, I do this, I do that. A lot of my job is answering email. A lot of my job is focusing on GDPR and regulations, but not everybody's passionate about. And that's one of the biggest things I think everybody should take away from this, regardless of whether or not you're in InfoSec or interested in it. It's not always going to be straightforward. It's not always going to make sense. The things you're going to focus on in your, your field might be simplistic. They may not be, and that's okay. If you're super interested in doing risk management and there's a program for it, try it out. But don't say, well, if I don't get this, I can't do InfoSec. That is arguably the worst practice for you. Just take another, <laughs> take another stab at it, rather. InfoSec is a field that is super diverse. It has a bunch of entry points. There's no one right one. There's no wrong one. And if you're saying, well, you know, this is the way I think I've done it. This is the way most of my friends have done it. And I'm already in the field. Consider how you got there. Consider if you could have taken a different path. Diversity in so the sense of diversity of thought is such a powerful tool. By all, not all having the standardized background, that's what makes our field so unique. If it's, you know, say software engineering. A lot of people assume software engineering. Oh, you're going to go, you're going to get a CS undergraduate degree. You're going to join a tech firm. You're going to work there for a bit. Maybe you go to the Googles and Amazons of the world. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with the Googles and Amazons of the world. But InfoSec doesn't necessarily be like that. So one of the biggest things I learned in school about InfoSec is that I simply didn't need school to do InfoSec. Again, you know, bleeding edge security is great. And a lot of people think that being in InfoSec means bleeding edge security all the time. Everyone thinks that I'm getting the newest tool, I'm doing the newest thing. A lot of InfoSec is just good practices, sane practices, and discovering, yeah, this makes sense. I can do this. It's not inherently difficult. It's something you can focus on. It's something you can say, okay, you know, this has worked for a number of years. The idea of having a castle and a moat isn't a complex topic, but it's one that's very true in InfoSec. It's simply defense in depth. That's not a difficult topic for someone who's not an InfoSec to wrap their head around. There's a lot of inherent benefit if you do. If you realize that it works for a tower or it works for a castle, it may also work for the utilities that you're attempting to protect. In my case, I was looking at protecting selfies when working at Snapchat. The same practices work. While I didn't have a digital, while I didn't have a moat, I had a digital moat. So learn how to conduct yourself professionally if you haven't already done so. A lot of people that I've seen early on in their InfoSec career uh, will tweet about something kind of angrily, and they don't really recognize the value of perhaps someone can really bring us some insight. A lot of people say, oh, well, you're doing this new InfoSec thing. You're not following the help desk people. You're pissing them off. You know, that's not the way to do InfoSec. And I think it is at some point. I think what you should do is take into consideration the things other people are talking about and look at how you can influence that. If there's someone who's doing something you don't like, figure out why they're doing it that way. Don't simply say they're wrong. Just figure out why they're doing it that way. And in InfoSec, this is crucial. I've had a couple of people who are saying, okay, well, you do static analysis via this mechanism, and I disagree, but rather than simply saying they're wrong, I figured out what they meant by their actual question. Again, InfoSec is so adaptable. There's so much value in that. Make friends and do it frequently. If you really want to expand your InfoSec opportunities, what you should be doing is reading and talking. Sure, it's great to take a stab at things by going and saying, I like OWASP. I'm going to go learn web vulnerabilities. I'm going to read everything they've got, and then I'm going to pop web apps. And that may be very good. But some of that information, by the time it's published, may simply be out of date. So consider who else you can talk to. Is there anybody you know that likes web apps? Is there anybody you know in general that likes web apps? Maybe you're not friends with them, but you can talk to them. You should try to do that. This is perhaps one of the less fun aspects of security, and it ties in with the earlier one. Security and success in it involves a lot of humility. Sometimes you will be wrong. One of the greatest aspects I've learned as a progressive security engineer was learning to be wrong, and that that's okay. It's okay to mess up. It's okay to not be right. And it's going to happen. Security has a lot of managing risk, and risk management means a lot for some people. It means a lot less for some people. Depending on who you are, risk management could be the entirety of your career or something you simply acknowledge occurs at some point. 
So you may get blamed for things that you didn't do. You may get blamed for things you did. And regardless, learning how to take that in stride is so important as an information security engineer and as an information security professional. Your job as an information security engineer or an information security professional should be able to best explain what you know and how you can best help people. That's effectively the job. As information security engineers, we strive to benefit people. Yes, it's great to be protecting things in one way or another, but at the end of the day, our core component is benefits. Our core component is we can bring something to the table that's helping people, that's providing our assistance, providing our end state. And be you. Now, I've said a lot of things that you can do. I've said a lot of things of how I've succeeded, but that's not going to be your story. Your story is your own, and that's such a powerful thing. In InfoSec, that can be whatever you want it to be, and that's great. There's a ton of really, really sell stellar value in that. It's okay to be what you want to be. You know, if some of this didn't mesh with you, very well. You know, if you say, oh, this is complete BS, John, okay. I'm totally fine with that. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what you think. Let's see what you think is the best method. There's no inherent reason we have to do things one way or another. Imposter syndrome is real, and just because I've spent the last 45 minutes or so talking about how I did InfoSec doesn't mean I wake up and every morning and say, you know, should I really be here? Do I really know what I'm talking about? Arguably, I do. But, you know, be proud of your accomplishments. Take what you've learned, but look how to better yourself for it. Keep looking forward. A lot of people say, well, I'm an InfoSec engineer now. I've made it. I'm done. But look how you can continue doing benefits. Look how you can continue improving the lives of people around you. Again, the benefit is for you. The benefit's also for other people. You're an information security engineer. You're focusing on the betterment of everybody. And what I didn't learn in school was that InfoSec is for everyone. It's not just a field where you have to gatekeep and you can say only these people can do it, only that people can do it. It's open. It's free. It's something you can presumably get into regardless of your economic background, your social status. It's a field where you are what you want to be in it. And you can give contrib contributions where you want to give. There's no one right, wrong, or like the path just simply doesn't exist. So I kept this in because I think, realistically speaking, we need to take a lot of humor in InfoSec. InfoSec is a scary space. Looking at things like Cambridge Analytica and these huge scandals, information security engineers are commonly called into practice. People say we're greedy, people say we're confusing, that we're doing these shady things. Information security doesn't have to be a shady career. It doesn't have to be something that's, oh, they're a hacker. Hacker, for some reason, has such a negative connotation, but we should return to what hacking originally was. Hacking was going in, taking apart something, and finding how to improve it, finding how to make it yours. And that's not bad. That's not evil. That's not unethical. That's not a thing that should be viewed upon negatively. And as long as we recognize that, that's huge. So there are too many names to thank on how I've gotten to where I am in InfoSec. And frankly speaking, while this presentation has covered a number of aspects, one of the greatest contributions I found when I originally gave this presentation was the questions that came up in Q&A. Q&A is huge because you know we can talk and I can talk at length about how I got into InfoSec and why I thought it was the good thing to do going from you know looking at static analysis at Apple to pen testing at Snapchat. There's no real right or wrong answer, and that's totally fine. And one of the best benefits is asking, talking, the things I've been mentioning the entire time. That's how this presentation really has value. So if you've got any questions, please, please feel free to ask them, whether it's here, on my Twitter, on my email. I'm happy to answer them. So thank you. You've got questions. I've got answers. If you don't want to say it, tweet it at me, and I'll respond. Otherwise, you can email me, and I'm happy to respond. Jonathan, uh, I'll help with the Q&A. And I wanted to start with a question that I have for you. Sure. One is, do you have a formal mentor? And if you do, how did that relationship begin? Yeah, um, just so I'm checking. I've paused my screen, correct? Looks like it. I'm just exiting out of a few things. I have a couple formal mentors. So the way I established a mentorship within what I'm doing in InfoSec was that initial first boss. While he doesn't quite do what I do anymore, that first boss was someone who was Ian Meyer. He's at Ian Meyer on Twitter. He was someone who I said, you know, this guy kind of seems to know what he's talking about. And he did. He was super useful and super helpful for me. He said, I'm passionate about this topic, and I hope I can help you explore it. And that was that. 
mentorship, being able to talk to people, finding other interested individuals in the space, that is invaluable. That's not something you can put a price tag on. That's not something you can teach in school. But you can find those people through school. I found a ton of really good InfoSec mentors through my program. Surprisingly enough, not at all focusing on InfoSec. Excellent. Uh, next question from Steven. What do you recommend on networking as an introvert? Networking as an introvert is a interesting process. So a lot of people feel really awkward and uh, I'll use the word gross because a lot of people really feel that. They say, oh, well, I don't want to network. Networking just doesn't, it doesn't feel genuine. Like it, it feels awkward, it feels wrong. It feels like this isn't something I should be doing when you're introverted sometimes. And that's totally okay. So what you should do, Stephen, is maybe send an email. Maybe go on Twitter. Find a medium that's comfortable for you. If that medium is going on, you know, going to talks, going to conferences, then do that. But if that medium is going on Twitter, perhaps having a pseudo-anonymous you know, Twitter handle, a lot of people in InfoSec do that. I know many people who I'm very close friends with who have never at any point shared their real name or any aspect of who they really are, but they've definitely networked. Some of my best friends I simply knew through Twitter and while I got the opportunity to talk to them, I didn't talk to them in sufficient depth as, you know, hey, I'm this Twitter personality. So for networking as an introvert, find something that makes you comfortable. I would suggest definitely check out Twitter. If you're comfortable using your real name, then do it. If you're not, then consider a different option. Awesome. Uh, from T. Haven, if you don't want to be on call 24 hours a day, what options are there? I.e., yeah. hour a day option. Yeah, so I totally feel that one. Um, I am frequently on call 24-7, but in, in this sense, I actually really enjoy it. If you don't want to be on call 24 hours a day, something that you should consider is working in a SOC. The good aspect of a security operations center is that it really is what you make it. If you want to work for eight hours, there's a bunch of places that you'll work for eight hours and then you'll leave. Once that eight hours is done, it's effectively no longer your problem. And that's a really good option. There's a bunch of nine to five places where you can do InfoSec, again, 24 seven, but you don't have to. You know, establish with that with your employer. Say, you know, I don't want to be doing this for 24 seven. I, I want to be doing this as a nine to five. And that's really between you and your employer. There's a lot of InfoSec places that can do that. There's a lot of InfoSec places that don't. It's really up to you. I have a, another question while we're waiting for other people to ask. So once again, if you have questions, yep. please ask them. Um, can you explain what B-Sides is and how you uh, can get involved with B-Sides if people don't? Sure, know certainly. Yeah, so B-Sides is a localized security conference started by a number of people in the information security team. The premise behind B-Sides is it's a local event where you can go hang out with like-minded people and talk about InfoSec. They're usually small. It's not like the Black Hats or Defcons of the world, although there are some, definitely some very large ones. The B-Sides Orlando event that I spoke at, uh, geez, a couple, maybe a month ago now, um, was about 800 people in the Orlando and greater Orlando area that are just really passionate about InfoSec. Being able to go there, meet people who really liked InfoSec, really saw the value in it was huge. And to get involved with those, uh, I mean, that's a multifaceted answer. What you should do, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, even if you're not necessarily wanting to go to one of these, is maybe find the community. So if you're in New York, say, type in B-Sides New York. Chances are there's already meet up. I know for New York there's one, but say you're you know, in New Haven, Connecticut, maybe there's one there too. Search it, see if there's anyone there. Maybe they'll have an IRC or a Slack and see if you can find some other people. Yeah, personally, one of the ways I got involved with B-Sides was just showing up to volunteer to stuff bags. And uh, volunteer. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, people heavily value being able to just have someone be useful. Again, InfoSec is this field where it's really what you make it. And one of the greatest things is, yeah, besides, show up, help out. People love that. That's invaluable. It's InfoSec is what you make it. And I think while I've, you know, sort of harped on that and extend it, which is probably getting annoying, it's so true. You know, InfoSec is really this one field where you can simply turn it into whatever you want to turn it into. InfoSec is not like being a doctor or being a lawyer where there's a set path and you have to follow that path. I know people who are only tangentially involved in InfoSec. You know, they saw it from, wow, that seems interesting, or I saw about hacking on the news and now I want to learn more about it. 
InfoSec doesn't have to be this rote, you have to do this this way, you have to do this that way. InfoSec can really be whatever you want it to be. I have uh, one last question. Uh, for people who are listening who may want to get involved with their local college or they have people that they know that are getting ready to go to college for cybersecurity, what advice yeah. would you give them for their being a teacher or mentor or just somebody who's just starting out? I mean, I know you've covered yeah. that, but just the first step. Sure. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll approach that from two angles, one of which is if you're looking to help out people, and then the other one is if you're looking to be helped. Uh, if you're looking to help out people, find a university near you. Find a high school near you. Find some academic institution near you. People are gathered there to learn, so you're going to have some inherent value if you're saying, hey, let me help you learn something. Perhaps there's a club. Perhaps there's a B-side. There's that, too. Again, it's a location where people gather to learn interesting things. It's the nature of a conference. So go in say, how can I help? How can I be of assistance? I know this thing. Perhaps I know this thing very well. Let me help you out with it. There's people who I've met who are in application security who ended up going to a B-Sides event and then ended up doing a formal mentorship just because they found someone who really wanted to learn more. I think generally in the InfoSec, people, in, in the InfoSec community, people are super willing to help, and that's a fantastic aspect. People are willing to share their insights, share their knowledge, and benefit you. I don't think people are often acting in this self-interest field. It's fantastic. And it's like the one field where you're, I'm capable of going up to someone who's, you know, CISO of a Fortune 500 company and saying, you know, what's your, what's your thoughts on like stage fright? What's your thoughts on uh, some of these crazy vulnerabilities you've seen over the past few years? Uh, if you're looking to get help, definitely, you know, start looking at the sites I mentioned. SANS is obviously a great place because you've got a bunch of really solid people. Look for SANS events. See when SANS events are going on and say, hey, I'm interested in this. Can you tell me more about it? There's a B-Sides event. Say, hi, you know, I really want to learn thing. And figure out what that thing is for you. If that thing is application security, then that's great. If that thing is risk management, that's great too. Figure out whatever it is for you and then pursue it. All right, Jonathan, that is the last question. Uh, I, we have one here, but I'm going to send him the link. He asked um, if we have... Or something about time management. I guess if you want to cover it, I'm also going to drop in the. Oh. I have an old webcast going in the background. I was trying to figure out what that is. So I'm dropping in the chat right now a webcast that we did on time management uh, from the beginning of the year. So if you were there, just go ahead and click on that. Uh, also in the notes on YouTube, I will put the link to the other webcast. But Jonathan, uh, as you close, do you have any tips on time management? Yeah. So time management, especially in InfoSec, was something that it's it's tricky. Um, the the, uh, the reason I made sure to pause when I uh, exited out of the, the previous slide is because I, I almost religiously use my calendar. Uh, I plot everything down to when I get coffee in the morning. So time management for me, the real benefit was scheduling. For people who don't like to schedule a lot, they don't like their calendars being filled, I'd suggest looking at the Pomodoro technique. That's taking a timer. You set it for 10 or 15 minutes in which you're going to take a break, and then you work in sprints. So you work for 50 minutes, and then you will delay it for a bit. You will delay it for a bit, delay it for a bit, and then go. You know, you, it's a matter of figuring out what the balance is for you. For me, I found the Pomodoro technique definitely works as well, and that's how my calendar is structured. So what I'll do is I'll put 10 to 15 minutes for either session between each meeting I have, and focus explicitly on that meeting. And then when I'm out, I take some time, recoup figure out what I'm doing again, and then go from there. I definitely suggest not doing back to back to back. Some people think it makes them most productive, and if that works for you, check it out. But I'd say for most people, having some time to think in between is super helpful. Jonathan, that is all the questions we have today. Thank you for your time. Do you have any closing remarks before we turn it over to Carol? Yeah, I think, as, as always, uh, you know, InfoSec is what you make it. And regardless of what I said during this presentation, you know, many aspects of this can change. So I appreciate you all taking the time and putting up with the various background noises I've got. But if you're interested in talking to me more or you're interested in some of the stuff Sans is doing, check out their website or check out what I'm working on. I definitely encourage you to do it. And I think you'll gain a lot of value from both. Thanks. Jonathan, thank you. Uh, slide eight was to do the thing. And thank you for doing the thing today that I asked you to do. And really appreciate it. I appreciate it as well. Thank you so much. All right, Carol.
All right. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. For our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.